first reading today is from Amos. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with one line. With one line in his hand, and the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And he said, a one line. And I said, I see a one line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a one line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. And then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile, away from this land. And Masi said to Amos, O Seir, go flee away to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there, prophecy there, but never again prophecy at Bethlehem. For it is this king's sanctuary, and it is the temple of the king. The name is answered, Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor prophet's son, but I am a hurt, and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our song today is in the grade five. I will listen to what the Lord God is saying, for you speak peace to your faithful people and those who turn their hearts to you. Truly, your salvation is very near to those who fear you. That you are away from the other one and the other. Steadfast love and faithfulness have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Faithfulness shall spring on up from the earth. grant prosperity, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness shall go before the Lord, and shall prepare for God to have Second reading is from Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will. To the praise of his glorious grace that he be freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all with all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ. As a plan for the fullness of time, to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him, in him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promise of the Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his partners and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half of my kingdom. Well, she went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, the head of John the Baptist. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved. Yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, O Christ. You may be seated. Well, to go back to the kids' sermon for just a minute, number one, you can see why I talked about sports and not the Gospel. <laughs> short little sentence for kids to repeat. <laughs> so that's why I said, oh, that's an aside. Okay. So this sermon about this gospel. There's a book by Phyllis Tribble entitled Texts of Terror. And in the book, Phyllis examines the most awful texts in the Old Testament. There are pages from the Bible that we wish we could accidentally eliminate. There are stories of beatings and tortures and murders. Well, who in their right mind would <coughs> preach on texts like that? <laughs> the answer is no one. And most of the time, the lectionary tends to omit many of these texts. You know, we have a three-year cycle of readings, okay? And most of the time, those texts are omitted. Well, during this summer of 2024, as we explore the Gospels, we preachers calmly progress through a summer of Mark's texts, the calling of the disciples, a handful of parables, a few miracles, and then, boom, out of the blue, there it is, Mark's own text of terror. The story of the beheading of John the Baptist is gruesome. The events leading up to it are really hard to believe if we think about it. Herod the king was definitely a mixed bag. He divorced his wife so that he could marry his brother's wife, Herodias. But you see, Herodias was not just the wife of Herod's half-brother. Herodias was also the daughter of another of Herod's half-brothers. Got that? A little confusing. So when Herod married Herodias, he was marrying his sister-in-law sister and his niece at the same time. I think it's kind of complicated, really. And if we look at the law of the Old Testament, that was clearly a violation of that. And so what happened? John the Baptist publicly denounced the marriage. Well, you can guess who was furious. Herodias was furious. Herod was angry also, but at least he had a conscience, and he genuinely did not want to kill John. 
up to what he believed, Herod gave in to the selfish obsession of his wife. And so Herod ordered John beheaded, and his head was presented on a platter to his wife's daughter, who presents the head to her mother. So, why would the people who put the lectionary together include this story? Where's the hope in it? It's the gospel's the hope. It seems to clearly be a story where evil triumphs over good. The righteous man loses his life. The weak and vengeful people get away with murder. It really is a sordid tale of anger and revenge, of resentment and death. Well, to understand the story better, it can help us if we look at what comes right before this passage. What Jesus does right before that is Jesus tells his disciples how to embody God's love in the world. You know, how to share God's love. And he tells them that as they speak the truth and share God's love, that they need to expect Opposition and trouble. Opposition and trouble. And he tells them, if we remember correctly, they weren't to take anything with them. All they needed to take is the gospel and then trust God. Just take the gospel and trust God. And so by including the details of John's death, Mark helps us to understand what can happen when we faithfully preach the gospel. Now, most of us won't have our heads taken off, but sometimes it can be difficult. We have to remember that there is danger when we tell the truth sometimes, especially to those in power, those who are in power and desperately want to keep power. So the story of John reminds us that being a Christian doesn't guarantee success in this life. You can see that throughout history. And that very likely there will be times of suffering. And then in addition, this story is really a story of the delusions of the powerful. Herod's afraid. You know, he's a powerful man, but he's he thinks Jesus is John raised from the dead. We see him later on, okay? When Jesus, before he dies. Herod killed John. And now, in his desperation and in his guilt, he thinks that John has come back to get him in the form of this new preacher, Jesus. In other words, even defenseless, unarmed, decapitated dead man like men like John the Baptist have a message that can come back to haunt those who use their power for evil. So men like John the Baptist who speak the truth speak to those who use their power for evil. There's a lot of examples here. Famous people that we know. One of the things that kept Mahatma Gandhi going against overwhelming odds was the conviction not just that love would conquer, but that evil would defeat itself. And that's what Jesus tells us good will eventually always prevail. And Gandhi said this. He said, when I despair, I remember that throughout history, tyrants and dictators have always failed in the end. And then Oscar Romero was appointed Archbishop of El Salvador because the church hierarchy thought that he was a safe and conservative scholar and that he wasn't going to challenge anything. And after he became bishop, he did a complete turnaround. And he became a champion for the poor. The poor living in that third world country. And he spoke out against the oppressive government forces. He won the love of the people. And 
and he won the hatred of those who were in power. You may remember this. He was gunned down on a Sunday while he was preaching in the cathedral in El Salvador. And instantly, Romero became an unstoppable spiritual force in the hearts of the Salvadorian people and a symbol of freedom and justice around the world. And so the story of the beheading of John makes it crystal clear that God's work is risky. We're probably not going to be beheaded. We're not going to be killed. But Jesus asks us to love and defend those who are poor, who are helpless, those who need Thank you. 